Welcome, welcome to another Life is All About Choices. My name is Nancy Muller. I am the host of Life is All About Choices. And this is a video platform where I interview people who at one point in their life had something come up where people or the universe said, you can't. And they turned around and said, watch me. And holy moly, let me just tell you, today's guest, Tanner, he is like the poster child for this. And I'm really, really excited for you to meet my friend Tanner. Tanner and I met several years ago when I interviewed him for my podcast. And um, we've remained friends. And I think he's super awesome. And I'm really excited to share him on today's video platform. So Tanner, welcome. Thank you so much, Nancy. I'm so, I'm so incredibly happy to be here. I love Life is All About Choices because it's so true. And uh, that really resonates, you know, deeply with me. So, you know, thanks for having me. Um, thanks for being my friend. Thanks for your contributions to the world. And I, I'm been looking forward to our conversation. So thank you again. You are so welcome. So I have to tell everyone, just kind of set the scene a little bit. When Tanner and I um, met several years ago, we were talking and he mentioned that one of the things that he really, really, really wanted to do. Um, so you may have noticed that T Tanner is blind. He is blind in both eyes. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But what he said, something that he really, really wanted to do at the time was to ride a roller coaster. He had never ridden a roller coaster uh, since becoming blind. And it just so happens he lives in Arizona. I live in California and he was due to be in California. And I said, Hey, when you're in California, why don't I pick you up and we'll go to Disneyland? And he's like, are you sure? And I said, yeah, I'll take you on a roller coaster. But you need to know that I meant I'll take you and stand in line while you ride the <laughs> roller coaster. I really wasn't planning on riding the roller coaster. And I may edit that in like towards the end of this. I don't know. I'm still thinking about it. But um, because we took a video right after we got off the roller coaster. But yes. um, oh my gosh. So we made that happen. We went to Disneyland. We rode the roller coaster. And I was the biggest chicken, muck, muck, muck chicken, let me tell you. And I thought, okay, if he can do it, I can do it. And one of the things for me, Tanner, was, you know, as the roller coaster started to leave the platform, you knew at that time, I don't think you knew before that, but you knew then how, um, how scared I was. You, you really oh, yeah. felt it. I know. And you put your hand on my knee and I just felt this reassuring, like, I'm here for you. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're going to do this. And it was such an amazing, amazing experience on my part. And I know it was on your part as well. But um, I think it's just one of the testaments to what you're doing in your life that you are not allowing any person, place, or condition to hold you back. And I, I, I just applaud you. You're, you're one of my superheroes. Oh, thank you so much. Well, you know, life's all about choices, right? And uh, I'm so blessed that you opened up the opportunity for me to make that choice and ride the roller coaster. I was, I was scared too at first. You know, I knew we were going to be safe, but it's just, you know, we always have, uh, you know, it's, we're human. And so we get these fears about doing things, especially when we've never done them before. You know, the, the context for me was never riding a roller coaster without being able to see where we're going. So thank you for joining me uh, on that adventure. It was pretty epic. Yeah, yes, it was. And just I'll have to be uh, totally honest, uh, my eyes were closed the whole time. So <laughs> <laughs> well, both of us. Uh. <laughs> so uh. Tanner, okay, start out sharing with the audience, um, you know, who you are, what you do and why you're so fabulous, how this all got started. Um, be I just want people to know that Tanner is a gold medalist in the Olympic Games representing America. He's a third, three time World Series MVP beep baseball player, and he was blinded in an auto accident at age 21. So, um, Tanner, I don't know, would you want to start from the accident, but maybe start from there that, that thing that happened that, you know, life just said, no, you can't. 
Yeah, I mean, certainly. Thank you again. So I, uh, all American kid growing up playing sports, did pretty decent in school, uh, was fortunate enough to play a little bit of sports in college. Um, I was in, uh, I was at ASU in the dorms when 9-11 happened. And I saw that second plane fly into the building that was, you know, the World Trade Center. That was pretty influential in my life and my brother's life. And when uh, I dropped out of college, he and I were going to enlist in the military together in the buddy system. And we were like, what are we going to do? Are we going to do the Army? Are we going to do the Air Force? What are we going to do? And so we were going to go into the Air Force. And, uh, and I ended up uh, backing out right at the last second. And, you know, I was in uh, uh, not in the right mental space. Uh, and so I just tried to find my way. Eventually I did. And I realized, like, I got to get out of here. I got I to gotta grow up and mature and develop some life skills. And so uh, at the time, school just wasn't in my cards. So I was deep back into the enlistment process. And, uh, you know, I'd already taken my test. I did the ASVAB. I was just ready to, to sign on the dotted line. And then I was in a, a really horrific auto accident where a tree came through my windshield and impaled me in the face. Uh, I woke up in the hospital like six weeks later. Um, you know, I had a couple brain surgeries, complete reconstruction. I broke my back. Um, you know, I lost, uh, you know, I woke up with uh, blind in both eyes. Uh, so my right eye is fine. It's just the, the optic nerve, the uh, traumatic brain injury and uh, inflammation of my brain pressed the optic nerve against my skull for a prolonged period of time. And so the optic nerve died. And uh, so I just see total blackness and that's what I woke up into. And um, yeah, and then I started uh, just, you know, realizing, you know, that life is all about choices. Um, my dad said some pretty influential words that um, still ring true for me today. And when things are down, I just remember that perspective. Um, you know, it could always be worse. It's, it certainly could be for my life, and I'm sure for your life as well. You know, we got it pretty damn good. And, but we can lose sight of that because things always get so magnified when they're happening to you. And... So anyway, so I went uh, back to school, started working, um, found out about sports for the blind and beat baseball, and uh, then learned about the Paralympics that, you know, these are all foreign concepts to me. And, uh, you know, I was very fortunate to have a lot of success there and started uh, uh, that started a speaking career and a coaching and consulting career. Um, in uh, health and fitness and nutrition and coaching. So that was great. And then um, I got into the corporate world and in this, into sales. I was doing a lot of sales when uh, before I lost my sight. So that was really a natural fit for me. And uh, now I'm very blessed um, to have just gotten a new job at the American Foundation for the Blind and I'm doing business development and sales for large organizations, for organizational inclusion uh, from the top down. We're really focused on employment outcomes and creating a world of no limits for people who are blind and visually impaired. And uh, as I quickly, quickly learned, uh, you know, living life with a disability uh, is filled with societal limits, uh, dogmatic uh, antiquated beliefs about disabilities and uh, you know when I was first blind it was super super hard um, because I know what it is to be you know an athlete uh, you know typical jockey male who has you know pretty decent success at almost anything I try and to turn around and wake up in the blink of an eye and, you know, just hear, no, 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 you can't, you can't, you can't, barrier, 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 wall, 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 and, and literally treated like a third class citizen. Um, you know, that was, uh, that was super hard. But, you know, like, like Nancy's show, you know, life is all about choices. And so I just made the choice to break that barrier down. <laughs> 
Tanner, share with us what your dad said to you, because I think it's really phenomenal. Yeah, so thanks so much. So I, um, at the time I was recovering back in my parents' house. I, I'm literally a bag of bones. I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I, I'm a, I like to stay in shape and stuff. And, um, you know, but at the time I'm, I'm like Skeletor. I've got a, a pick line in my arm. I, I have IV medications every four or five hours, nonstop. And uh, my jaw is currently wired shut. Um, and I'm just so depressed because uh, there's other medical stuff going on. And it's like, even if I do survive that, like literally my life is being threatened uh, and the doctors have no plan. You know, they keep doing stuff. There's no guarantees that I'll live. And I was like, and so even if I do live, you know, I'm totally blind. Like, what am I going to do? And so I was so weak and, and thin that I, could, I couldn't hold myself up. And so I'd sit, I'd sit like this, just hanging down. And when my dad would see me like that, he would, you know, he would say, chin up. Real aggressive. And, um, and I always would. And uh, this evening, I didn't. I was waiting for my mom to finish cooking me a chicken quesadilla. And he comes around the corner and says, chin up. And I just stay there hanging. And so he, he knows something's pretty wrong. He comes and he sits down next to me. He puts his hand on my knee and says, Tanner, son, what is wrong? Is there anything that I can do to help? Help? <laughs> like, I'm totally blind. I'm blind. There is nothing you can do to help. My life is worthless. My life's meaningless. My life is over. I just want to die. And he says, son, that is not the attitude that you need to have. I know that it's tough right now. But let me tell you something. You could be blind and you could be in a wheelchair. As a matter of fact, you should be. You could be blind in a wheelchair and Tanner, mentally, you should be a vegetable. You should be dead. I know that it's tough right now, son. It's always going to be tough for you. But let me tell you something. It could always be worse. And no one, no one put how much worse it could be in perspective for me. Like I'm just drowning in my own sorrow. I, I don't really see a way out. And yet, at the same time, I can't see how good I have it. Like, I still have my hands and my feet, right? Like I can walk, I can talk, I can think, I can articulate, communicate a message, an idea, my ideas, my value. And I realized that, you know, my life is going to be tough. And no one's going to make it easy for me. So it's gonna be up to me to create the life that I wanna live. And um, so starting that day that I made that choice and uh, the first thing I did was, um, you know, I realized that being blind and uneducated, you know, I only have a high school diploma, I dropped out of college, that, you know, <laughs> my chances for doing really anything of significance is gonna be pretty limited. And, you know, I was, that was just a young, you know, young thought uh, stuck in kind of like an old school methodology of thinking. But I thought, you know, hey, I got to get a degree. I've got to go to college. And so I didn't know how to use a computer as a blind guy. I didn't know how I was going to take notes. I didn't know how I was going to read a book. Um, I didn't know how I was going to do take a test, do anything. And, uh, and I showed up, you know, showed up. And so I got out of, I got out of the hospital May 31st. My father told me this. Uh, in early July, um, and 
for that fall semester, the very next month, just a couple months after getting out of the hospital, IV pole in hand, I show up to school, start going to class. You know, later that semester, I, I had to take two tests over the phone from ICU um, because I had brain surgeries. And, um, you know, but I made it through. You know, I just made the choice to keep going. And uh, it's hard, um, but uh, it could always be worse. Tanner, your, your story is just always, every time I hear it, I, I, I just, I get something new from it. A new sense of um, conviction that you know that you're here for a purpose. Mm -hmm. And we all believe that life has to be a specific way because basically, you know, right. that's how we're taught. But nothing says I'm here for a purpose and I have to find my own way in this purpose. And those of us that are finding our own way in our purpose are really out there um, paving the way and making a difference for others. And that's what I see you doing in a big way. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, and I couldn't resonate more with what you said about how we like find our own way. Like I've done so many things, right? Like since I lost my sight that I would have never have thought would have been possible, like never. And, and I'm just continuing to evolve myself and find my new way and find the new me and who I am right now and what moves me, what I'm passionate about. Like these things are evolving and ever changing and, and, you know, finding your way is all about doing and, you know, trying new things, meeting new people, going to new places, pushing yourself beyond uh, that comfort zone and, you know, by doing that stuff is, um, you know, you know, choosing to take action is, is how I got here. You know, but it's all, it was also, I was also elevated and augmented by, you know, my mom, you know, my mom is, uh, you know, she is like my rock. And she was the one who really, you know, helped push me when it was super hard. I'm, I'm a big believer of surrounding yourself with, like-minded, positive people, because um, it is hard to take over the world when you're an army of one. Uh, but uh, having a, a team behind you uh, gives so much strength and power to every individual. Absolutely, absolutely. And when we um, work collectively, I mean, gosh, we just, we move mountains. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And one of the things we, we, I talked about it at, at the beginning when I talked about that you play, you're actually a three time World Series MVP, baseball, like awesome superhero person in beep baseball. And yeah. you are the one, I never even knew it existed until I met you. Can, you. can you talk about beep baseball and what that is? Yeah, it's really tough to put into, in, into words. And it's like even the videos that you see don't really give it justice. You kind of got to like feel it and see it and be a part of it, but I'll do my best. So, it, it, and it's tough because beat baseball is the adaptive version of baseball for people who are blind or visually impaired. And so there's some significant differences in the game that really don't make sense. Um, you know, for example, you know, the pitcher is on the batting team, right? Because it'd be super easy to strike out a blind guy. So the pitcher's on the batting team because the, the, the purpose or the object is to hit the ball. And so that's one way we affect that. And then um, in the field, um, to get someone out, you don't have to, like, pick up the ball and throw it to first base because, you know, that would induce a lot of concussions of spectators. <laughs> so, you know, to get an out, you literally just have to find the ball, stop it, pick it up, and – pick it up off the ground away from your body uh, before the runner gets to the base. And um, so, so how does a blind person run to the base? Well, the base actually buzz. It's a constant buzz, 100 feet away. And there's either first base or third base. You don't know which one you're running to. It's a, uh, there's a base operator that turns it on as the ball is being pitched. And so, you know, ball's being pitched, bam, I hit it. 
and man, the bass turns on. The ball, beep, 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 and it's beep baseball. The ball beeps, and the defense is strategically placed. There's six people in a lineup, and they are in their zones, and they communicate and talk just like a regular team would, and um, they locate the ball, pick it up, pull it away from their body, and uh, that's it. There's six innings, three outs to uh, – to each team for each inning, and uh, that's the, the basic gist of it. But I think one of the things that's so cool about it is, like, the unity and teamwork that goes into it, plus that's it's elevated, like, the suspense, the, the, the emotion, the drama is elevated because everybody has to be quiet. And then, you know, like, a run gets scored or a big put-out is made and everybody erupts. Ah! You know, and it's just... Um, and it's a, it's a super high action game. It's not like regular baseball where it's like a duel between the pitcher and the batter and, you know, great pitcher means like no one's really ever hitting um, a couple hits here and there, but in a high level beat baseball, almost everybody's hitting and they're hitting the ball deep, hard, long, fast. And the defense is like flying around the field and it's just, you know, um, I would have never have thought this before I lost my sight, but there are some amazing athletes who just happen to be blind or visually impaired. And a lot of them love to play beat baseball. You know, I, I, as I watched it and when you first introduced it to me, I, I kind of thought it should be called, it should be called Zen baseball. <laughs> <laughs> You know, about it, you know, like you're, you're listening for the sound and you're going in a direction. It's like, you really are using all of your senses to play oh, yeah. this game and, um, allowing the senses that the, the dominant senses to take over for the, the senses you don't have. And right. I don't know, it just, to me, it's like a very Zen way of doing something. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And, you know, so uh, like I also, I cannot smell. I lost my sense of smelling and I also have a hearing impairment in my right ear. And so I'm at a way significant disadvantage, uh, you know, on multiple planes. So like, I like to say I'm batting 500 on the senses. I can touch, I can halfway hear, uh, and I can, I can taste. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, uh, yeah, I mean, just the magic that goes into, like literally blind people running around in space with third party objects flying through the air and then, you know, communicating, navigating, negotiating these situations at high rates of speed. Um, it is very, very fun. Very, very fun. Well, I think it's awesome. And I, I'm learning so much from you. Um, but you know, Years ago, when I, I, I broke both ankle bones in my left leg, and I was in a wheelchair for four months, and that four you months... Told me, you told me that you weren't going to bring up the time that I kicked you. <laughs> well, you know, you should watch where you're going, but uh, I'm just being in that wheelchair for four months, um, it really gave me um, an insight into you know, a disability because we think, Oh, there's a ramp. Oh, there's a, a, a wheelchair stall. Oh, there's a, but we really, as someone without any kind of disability cannot even comprehend what someone with a disability is going through. And yeah. I feel that as you share your message, um, it's, it's one more opportunity for people to hear and maybe open their minds and their hearts and be more compassionate towards people with disabilities and know they're people just like us. They're just finding their way in the world in a different way than we're finding ours. Totally. Yeah. I mean, a hundred percent. I mean, you're describing that and I'm just like, like so many like flashbacks and observations of what people have done to me, uh, how people treat me. Um, and it's just, it's just mind boggling. Like for a person who doesn't have a disability, it would be ridiculous to think that, you know, when you're getting ready to cross the street, someone that you, you, you don't know, you've never spoken to ever before in your entire life, who, who this person doesn't say anything to you, just walks up, you know, walks up behind you, grabs you by the arm and pulls you across the street. Yeah. 
or you go to a restaurant and you order some food and the waitress doesn't even talk to you, won't say anything to you, even when you're placing your order. And instead of confirming the order or saying, okay, great, turns to the person that you're with and says, is it okay if they order that? Oh my gosh. You know, the, at a doctor's office, you know, the person that you're with, they're asking the person that you're with personal questions about you and uh, you answer. And the whole conversation is the, the staff talking to the person you're with, asking the questions to the person you're with, you answering. And it's just like triangle or the humiliation of having to answer medical questions in a lobby uh, with other patients there about your personal medical history. You know, it's, it's the out loud, you know, communicating orally. So, I mean, and it goes on and on and on from employment, you know, the hiring and recruitment process to travel and transportation uh, to just every experience that you can imagine. You can't imagine how different it is for a person with a disability. It's given me so much empathy and sympathy for, you know, people who experience other types of discrimination. Mm -hmm. You don't realize, it's like, I make it akin to back pain, right? Like, you don't know how debilitating back pain is until you have back pain, right? Like, for you, like, you don't realize how debilitating broken ankles are and what it's like to live in a wheelchair until you've lived in a wheelchair. Right. And so it's such a foreign concept for people to understand, like, even... I know, like, even my descriptions right now of all these situations, it's so detached from everybody's reality that it's really tough to conceive. Um, and then it happens every day. And you're like, what? WTF? <laughs> like, what is going on here? Mm-hmm. So, and, and, and especially when those experiences have never happened to you for over two decades of life, they've never happened to you. And you, and then you're trying to navigate your way through all that BS. Mm-hmm. It's um, pretty freaking frustrating. One of the things that I always thought was um, pretty amazing about you were when people would um, approach you with a product and they say, here, we've created this for the blind, but it's right. usually a sighted person that created the product. And right. then, you know, they ask you to try it. For instance, the the glasses that um, you were using when we went to Disneyland. That was very interesting. Um, You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so you're talking about the Ira glasses, which Mm -hmm. are basically like a personal concierge service. It's like these glasses with a camera on them. You know, it integrates via Bluetooth with an app on my iPhone. And through the iPhone, I can call somebody who you know, on their computer screen, they can see what's up with the, uh, what's coming through the camera. And then so they can give me like guidance and directions based on what they're seeing in the camera. So I use that for if I have to sign a document or if I need help getting, you know, from point A to point B in a location that I don't know, I can't see any signage, obviously, or I'm not sure how to get there. And if I'm alone by myself and no one's around, I can't ask for help then that would, you know, be a resource that I can tap into. Um, And so there's some limitations with the product, um, but, you know, you know, testing, you know, testing products and things that are developed by sighted people, um, you know, especially things like uh, websites or mobile apps um, is pretty interesting when, you know, it's these things that maybe serve specifically those populations or are intended to include those populations. And they've never included those people, people with disabilities, in the development of those products and services. Um, and so that's where a lot of people go wrong. Mm-hmm. I think one of the, the greatest uh, opportunities for people to improve their products or services, employment outcomes, their organizational inclusion, is to just ask with, uh, with sincerity and preface, preface those questions with something like, hey, 
I'm not sure about this. I'm probably going to sound really stupid. You're going to think that I'm like bozo, but I just want to make sure that we're doing this the right way. Can you tell me how to make this better? Can you tell me, do you mind sharing with me how to do this the right way for you? And just something as simple as that um, can really make the difference for both parties and uh, create equity and trust within a relationship uh, and, and advance, advance the outcomes for all stakeholders much faster than just doing it on your own. Well, and I think that, um, you know, we're all raised with specific beliefs about yeah. what is uh, acceptable and what is not acceptable and so if people are walking around you know with the specific belief that oh you can't go up to a blind person and ask him a question about being blind that would be rude and yeah. so we need to dispel these beliefs yeah so there's this uh, really great story that uh, my dad told me one time he said you know there's this guy he's in a median you know, walking back and forth, he had a white cane, just going back and forth, back and forth. He just looked so disoriented. He was clearly lost. I've been there. I've been lost, not knowing where I'm at. I got my white cane, and I'm trying to figure out how to get from, you know, to where I'm going. So he pulls over. He's driving down the street, pulls over, gets out of his truck, goes over, asks the guy, hey, um, you know, are, are you trying to get somewhere? Can I help you get there? And the guy says, yes, like, thank you so much. And so, you know, my dad, like, takes him to where he needs to go and gives him a couple bucks um, because he asked for a couple bucks. The guy was, the guy was um, you know, not socioeconomically inclined. And, um, and so after he did so, three people, three different people, came up to him on the, on the way back to his truck and said, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you helped that guy. I saw him there, but I didn't know what to do. Like, and it just is mind boggling yeah. that people can see other people who clearly need help, disability or not, and won't go up to offer support or see what's the see what the concern is or what the problem is, you know, because they're afraid, right? Like afraid uh, of being embarrassed. They don't want to do the wrong thing. They don't want to offend somebody uh, or whatever it is, whatever the root of their fear is. But that is just like so mind-boggling to me. So when I when I do speeches, when I talk to audiences, like you know, I I, I try to give them empowerment. Right, because uh, uh, you know how to address those situations. Because you know it sucks to be on the other side of that. You know, right. if you if you're broke down on the side of the road, and you you don't have a donut to change that flat tire, and you're stuck there, and just the highway of traffic just keeps flying by, flying by. You can't call the cops. You can't call um, uh, a tow truck. You can't call your insurance company to send anybody and you just feel helpless. Like, what are you going to do? And, and so, you know, try to put people in situations that help them understand that, you know, through no fault of your own, that tire is flat. And like through no fault of my own, did I get lost? Like it just, like things just happen. Mm -hmm. You know, what are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. How can you make the world better? I like that. How can you make the world better? And we can make the world better by just paying attention. You know, there are so many people walking around staring at their cell phones. They're not even paying huh. attention to where they're going or where they're walking. Um, I know when we were at Disneyland, I was appalled because I had never really seen it through from your side of it. I was going to say through your eyes, but, you know, from your side of it where people – I mean, you have your, your walking stick in front of you and you're, you know, obviously letting people know there is a blind person coming this way and people try to, you know, run in front of you or beat the person or, and I'm like, seriously, people, you know, what is going on with you? Yeah. But I was there with you. So, I mean, yeah. for you to get on a plane and get off the plane and get an Uber and, you know, come to my house. I mean, you did all of that. 
And, you know, people just don't stop and think about what it takes to do that. And if we could all be more compassionate, just when you see a person in need, do something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If just a regular person fell down because they slipped on a banana, you, you'd offer to pick them up or help them up. Right. But yeah, it's so weird. I mean, that's so funny though. Like people like running in front of me, like trying, like, because I'm going so slow, it can take five seconds to, like, you know, let me pass by two seconds, you know, or, or they jump over the cane, you know, they're like, ah, oh! they, yeah. you know, it's like, oh my gosh, you guys. <laughs> and, and I don't know if they like feel like they have a hall pass because I can't see them do it. It's like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm not deaf, like, I heard you. <laughs> Well, now, can you tell us about the American Foundation for the Blind? I know that um, this you're working for them now, and um, I just think that they're so fortunate to have you. So how can people get involved? How can they um, be part of the solution instead of part of the problem? Uh, thanks so much, yeah, Nancy. So I really appreciate um, that question. So just for historical context, the American Foundation for the Blind is the organization that, you know, Helen Keller spent a lot of time developing and really got going. So it's over a hundred years old. Uh, the current CEO is, is the fourth ever in the history of the organization. And so it has a huge dominant uh, force here in the United States. It's one of the longest, most active advocacy and empowerment agencies um, the nation has ever had. And so we focus that on blindness and visual impairment and creating a world of no limits and uh, right, societal limits, organizational limits, uh, financial and employment limits. And we try to reduce all of those barriers uh, until there is a world of no limits. And so there's a, a numerous ways to get involved. You know, you can volunteer uh, your time um, you can also volunteer your financial resources and make a contribution. Um, the arm of the AFB that I represent is in the business development and sales uh, for organizational inclusion and consulting services. So we sell strategic uh, solutions and consulting solutions for companies that are um, looking to figure out, you know, how do we go about recruiting and hiring people who are blind and visually impaired? How do we onboard them appropriately, train them appropriately, create the cultural environments and teams that, you know, open their arms to them and, you know, facilitate their growth and development and their ability to maximize their human capital within whatever role that may be? How do we create upper mobility paths for upward mobility and communicate that effectively? And how do we support those initiatives. Um, that's one piece. The other piece, which is also inherent to the same, is you know digital inclusion. So you know my uh, my cell phone here, you know, just like the computer that I'm talking on. You know, this has I have assistive technology on this device that allows me to access mobile apps, and on the computer that we're using Zoom for right now, you know, I've got my Outlook and my G Suite. Um, you know, I've got other softwares that integrate with the different programs. So as it relates to employment, like how do we ensure that these software, these assistive technologies, how do we make sure that those are compatible with our internal intranets and um, cloud-based softwares, um, you know, that support business practices, whether it's a uh, human resources information system, HR, HRIS, like PeopleSoft, or, you know, Oracle's platforms or, or, or any platform. Uh, any kind of digital environment. So, uh, and so that's, uh, those are the consulting and uh, strategy solutions that, uh, that I'm responsible for. So uh, it's, a, uh, it's a new role for me. I'm actually stepping down from a, a leadership role at a, another nonprofit. And, uh, but I am, I am so grateful and excited to be with the uh, American Foundation for the Blind. It is, um, an honor and a privilege um, to have the opportunity to create opportunities for people to advance their lives and improve their lives and really change 
um, societal stigmas and perceptions about what it means to live life with a disability and specifically blindness. That's fabulous. Now, Tanner, you and your beautiful wife have a beautiful little baby girl. Mm -hmm. And my question is, what do you think or how do you plan to educate her about, you know, we talk about how beliefs are incurred in childhood, how they, they start in childhood. How yeah. do, are you teaching her differently? I know she's very young yet, but um, how are you and your wife teaching her differently about disabilities? Well, I, I think you'd kind of mentioned something um, to what, you know, our macro approach is uh, a little bit earlier is that, you know, I'm going to, you know, the best way that I'm going to teach my daughter is living by example. And so I'm going to show her that, you know, despite my severe disability, that I can uh, create severe positivity and outcomes in my life. And so I, I go to work, like I can travel, I do travel, I play sports, I, you know, I eat healthily, I, you know, read books, I do everything that anybody else can do. Um, you know, I just have to do it a little bit differently. You know, I may not drive the car, but I can damn well order my Uber. And <laughs> as soon as, uh, as soon as Tesla's getting there, you know, I'm going to have my car and take my car to wherever I want to go. So, you know, I think it's about leading by example and teaching that, you know, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm just living my life. I'm, I'm going to do things a little bit differently than you may need to, um, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. And it's so analogous to her own life, right? Because she's a unique individual and she is uh, a person and she may have to do things a little bit differently than what is normal and that doesn't mean that she can't do it and even though she's different than somebody else doesn't make her better doesn't make her less than it just makes her her and whatever she wants to do you know life is all about choices so whatever that choice is she my hope is that i teach her how to just hustle so hard and um in, in the pursuit of that choice or the fulfillment of that choice. And uh, it's okay to make new choices. Just whatever choice you make, you just go all in 100%. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Tanner. That very mm. well said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being on the show today. Life is all about choices. I appreciate you bringing your expertise and your wisdom and your empathy and your passion uh, to the show and I love you. I think you're amazing. Um, and I look forward to in a couple of years having your daughter on and letting us know how she's making it. Life is all about choices. Uh, Wouldn't that be awesome? That'd be so cool. Thank Yes, it would be. And, and thank you so much for your words. I love you too. So grateful for you. Thank you. Nancy. Absolutely. And for all of you, I hope you really enjoyed this segment of Life is All About Choices. Be sure to subscribe to our channel so that you will be notified when we have future um, videos coming up. And remember, get out there and make it a, uh, a wonderful, great day. And who can you inspire today? Because everyone can inspire someone. In the meantime, this is Nancy Muller and Tanner Gears saying ciao for now. Okay, so I look a mess, I know. <laughs> but this is my friend Tanner. Hey. And he has not ridden a roller coaster since he lost his sight. And when I found out he was coming to Anaheim, I told him that I would take him to Disneyland and ride a roller coaster with him. Fulfilled. Yeah, but I, I, I don't do roller coasters. I haven't done a roller coaster in 25 years. So proud. Um, so it was huge for me as well, but I did it for my friend and Tanner. Share with them, please. Yeah, so it's been uh, the first time uh, in thir uh, since 2004 when I lost my sight that I was able to do this, and I'm so grateful to have a friend, uh, you know, uh, bring me on this adventure. It was quite the adventure. She was Nancy was so outside of her comfort zone. Um, I didn't realize how big of a deal it was, 
and I hope that this inspires you to one, help somebody else, provide a service of value to somebody else uh, in your life or a stranger, and two, to do like Nancy and get up outside your comfort zone because uh, great things happen there. All right, thank you. Ciao.